I come from uh, North Wales, and, which is to the left of England on the map. And uh, I started playing when I was about 18, 19, something like that. I've been professional since I was about 20, so that's the one side I come. <laughs> when I was 20, it was 1965, you know, so. Uh, 66, I suppose, really, because I was born in December, so I get an extra or subtract a year, whichever. And I started playing in bands around, you know, the local bands, but that was going to go nowhere because it was North Wales, you know. So I moved to Manchester and I got in a couple of bands up there, and then I moved to London. Well, I moved to Blackpool first, and then down to London in about 1967. And uh, carried on from there, you know, I joined Hawkwind in 71. I was in a couple of bands before that, and for a year I was a dope dealer, but that came to a terrible halt, you know. <laughs> And the police arrived, you know, and then uh, I joined Walkwind in 71 and I got fired in 75 and joined and started Motorhead up in 75 and that's it, you know, which brings us to the present you know, day. Which brings us upstairs to the cat club. <laughs> yes, right. Uh, originally, I was born in New York City, grew up on Long Island mainly, and uh, moved to London with the other two girls in the Stray Cats. <laughs> And uh, for Fashion Week, originally, I think it was. And uh, found ourselves homeless. No money, no nowhere to go. Abandoned. Abandoned by people we didn't even know yet. <laughs> and, uh, you know, kicked around town and eventually landed a few shows, and the rest is history. But at one of the first shows, Lemmy, my dear pal, was one of the first people to ever come see the Stray Cats. He caught wind of it. And certainly the first to applaud. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he being a closet rockabilly uh, was immediately acceptable. Kind of understood what we were doing as well. Yeah. He got it. Where a lot of people weren't quite sure what, what it was. They rockabilly. thought you were punks. So yeah. Weird punks, you know. Yeah. And, and one of the first times I met Lem, we went back to his house and he uh, uh, he had all these rare like BBC live recordings of Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran, stuff I'd never heard, and we thought we were experts and knew everything. <laughs> and it was like every record he played, I never heard this, where'd you get this? I never heard this. So, and we became fast friends, and we pretty much, you know, stayed in touch and been close over you know, 20 <laughs> something yeah, years. Something years yeah. and, uh, it's 30 uh, something years, isn't it? And then uh, Lem used to come up on stage with us and play sometimes, jam. One time Hammersmith Odeon, I remember. Yeah, and the Lyceum once. Yeah, and we thought he wanted to play bass the first time, and Lee's like handing him the double bass, and he's like, get me a six string. Yeah, right. <laughs> so we gave him the spare Gretsch, yeah. and he plugged it in, and we like ran through something else and something. And then we used to do Ace of Spades. Yeah. It was, it was made like a sound check song, and the one time we ever sound checked, we did it. And then we did it on stage one night, and I think that was the Lyceum. Yeah, it was. And. Uh, and then I came up with the encore after it. <laughs> Cause, because if you listen to it closely, those in the know, Ace of Spades is a rockabilly song. You need to slap bass on it. And, uh, you know, we just always stayed in touch and had a lot of cool adventures together, hang out in the clubs in London and knowing some of the same girls and yeah. avoiding uh, hostile gang members. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, finally, a couple years ago, we got a chance to really work together and we made a record of all, of, of all our favorite rockabilly songs. And uh, the original plan was to do a live DVD for it. And uh, two years later, we, <laughs> we got that together. <laughs> and we did it here at the world famous Cat Club, 8911 on the Strip. Which and, uh, Jim doesn't have anything to do with no. financially. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of one of those things where we, we always wanted to do, as, as a Stray Cats and Motorhead as well, I'm sure. It's like, to break down certain barriers with uh, that's this is just rockabilly, this is just hard rock, this is just uh, it's not. It's the record oh. company people have put everybody in a box now, you know. Like if you listen to one kind of music, you can't listen to any other kinds. Do you know what I mean? And they what they call channeling, you know, you know, like this. Uh, they, they don't wish to broaden; they, they wish to narrow it down, you know. And I think that's bullshit. Music is music. Everybody should listen to everything, you know. There's only two kinds of music in the world, you know, music you like and music you don't like, right? Exactly. And that's it, it's easy, you know, it's simple. You shouldn't be bound by 
what they think a category should be, you know, because I don't have any categories in my head, you know, and I won't have them put there by those assholes either. They ain't fit to judge me, you know. But that's what was refreshing last night to see. And I, I think as time time goes by, more of the genres seem to be Blurring, kind of crossing yeah. because these kids were too young to have seen us, let alone see Gene yeah. Vincent, you know. Right. And but it really speaks of how great that music was and how truly rebellious it was. It's very easy now to uh, to, to look back. And yeah, and, but back then. That what like Elvis did was truly rebellious. That, that was now it may seem tame. He didn't carve himself up with a razor blade on stage, but that's just that's theater. That's, that's nothing. details. Yeah, that's nothing. But uh, then the music was enough to make everybody freak out. You know, like yeah, exactly right, <coughs> exactly right. And uh, I mean, you have no idea how Elvis was in the early days. You know, when he first came out in the states, I mean, there was like he was denounced from every pulpit across America as the Antichrist. You know. He was, he was the doom of young people, and, uh, and like all these racist lunatics in the South, you know, like the, the smashing records on, on the air, you know, and all that stuff. And like he was really, I mean, now he's a cross between, El, you know, Frank Sinatra and Joan of Arc, you know what I mean? <laughs> but like back then he was like reviled completely, you know. I mean, he, people would cancel shows in town, you know, the police department would cancel. I mean, we had that too, but not, nothing like Elvis had it. Because he was the first, you know. I mean, Bill Haley was the first, but we we weren't really fooled by Bill Haley because he was a fat little guy with a kiss curl, you know. Like, I knew, I knew that wasn't it, you know. <laughs> right. But then Elvis showed up, and he was everything. He everything about him was different. You know, he had these sideburns which you'd never seen before. You know, we were all still on wartime utility haircuts. You know, no hair below the like temples. And Elvis came. I remember thinking the Beatles had outrageously long hair, and you look back at it now. And it's just brushing the tops of their ears, you know. And I remember thinking, my God, how can they grow their hair that long, right? You know, because that was the climate at the time. And that wasn't too long after Elvis. You know, it was only three years after Elvis, four years after Elvis. But Elvis, without Elvis, none of us would be here. There'd be no music business. And kids still seek that out. They don't like what's on the radio. They don't accept what's in... Uh magazines or on television and and they to, don't the latest hit pick you know? and to be into that you really have to seek it out like there's kids in Belgium who live this lifestyle you know how hard it is to find a carburetor for an old Chevy in Brussels <laughs> you know they seek it out and it's all over the world the and, people in Moscow man yeah and it's you know? all new generations of it it's not just kids who were into the Stray Cats 20 years ago there it's it's new people who now kind of look to us the same way that Brian and I and Lee looked at Carl Perkins. It's 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 a new thing. Yeah, and it's, it's I like music going across the Berlin Wall, you know. I mean, kids in, in the communist half in East Germany were going up to the wall to listen to a concert that was going on the, on the other side, open air concert, and the the East German cops were hosing them down, and they still came back. They get hosed away from the wall and climb back up to try and hear it, you know, they, just to hear the music, right? Not to do anything political, just to hear the music. And that was the only thing they wanted. They didn't want to make a statement or, you know, fucking vote for anybody, you know, who's against communism. They didn't mind being communist. They just wanted to hear the music. And that's the point of it. That's how strong it was, you know. And, and I'm sure at any moment now, we're just about due for a new Sex Pistols, you know, or a new Beatles, you know. It's about time. We're about ready for somebody to change it all again. I wish it could have been us, but it wasn't. But there you go. You know, I'll stick in. Uh, I'll do my bit. But in, the, but in your own way, it's like, you're, you guys tour all the time, and it's always full, and it's dedicated people. It's more than just a band. Like I keep saying, it's more than just a band that had a couple hit records that had their. 15 minutes. Yeah. It's been lasting 25 years now, the 15 minutes. Yeah, you know, 25 it, it, minutes, yeah. Yeah. So there's something to be said for it. You know, that original rock and roll and other music that's been influenced by that is is very, very strong. And it certainly stood the test of time. It's, yeah. it's still, there's still kids who choose to cut their hair that way and live that life. It's still going on all the yeah. time. And, and they can't stop it. And it burns their ass and they can't stop it. Whatever they do. People will always seek out what they want to. You can't feed them enough reality shows and fucking American pop idol, you know, to stop them. Because a lot of people will accept that, and a lot of people, unfortunately, have. 
but it's still no substitute for a band that knows what it's doing. Yeah. You know. All, all the bad judges in the world, you know, can't raise enough laughs for you to, <laughs> to forget real music, you know. When the Cats first started, we were equally into the Clash and the Sex Pistols and yeah. early Motorhead records as we were into Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran and Buddy well, Holly. See, we were both crossover bands because punks and rockers used to watch us. Yeah. And punks and rockabillies used to watch yeah. you, you know. And so that punk thing was a great leveler, you know. I think the further we go along and the more kinds of things come out, really at this point all you can do is, uh, you know, music now is about where you draw your influence from. No one's going to invent anything at this point. It's yeah. kind of much, pretty much where you draw your influence from and how you combine your influences. When we first started, it was mainly like punk rock kids who let the sides of the mohawk grow in. Yeah. They, they, they had the bit in the front and they just let the sides grow <laughs> in and grew some sideburns and then they were rock for a while. Though. <laughs> exactly. But last night at the gig we did, it was no, mainly rockabilly people come out the woodwork last Mainly night. rockabilly kids and young rockabilly kids who were proud, who were definitely too young to see the Stray Cats the first time around. And one of them shouting Ace of Spades as well. Relentlessly. You know, <laughs> a, rock, a rockabilly kid shouting Ace of Spades. So I think it becomes more So he obviously acceptable. gets it, you know, he's listening to both. So exactly. that's cool, you know. Exactly. And then, you know, if you're going to form a band now that mixes the Stray Cats with Motorhead, then you're really on to something. You know? Yeah, then three quarters of the listening public don't know where the fuck to put itself. You know what I mean? Um, they're not supposed to do that. <laughs> That's what everyone says. What are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm going to do a gig with Lamb. What? Huh? <laughs> you know, you're allowed to be friends, but you're not actually allowed to play together. Yeah. That's like a whole other thing. But that's what it's all about. It's uh, as far back as you want to go. <coughs> Elvis was crossing hillbilly music with the uh, with, with, with rock, music, yeah. rock music, what they called it, rock and roll music, and invented rockabilly in the process, which yeah. turned into rock and roll music. And, and it, that's just you know. And the blues is a big thing, you know. I mean, people don't people nowadays don't even know the blues. You know, they don't even hear it because nobody plays it on the radio anymore. You know. And uh, like the blues is a huge influence in rock and roll. It's at least like half of it, maybe more. Blues and rockabilly together started it. You know, th yeah. that was rock and roll. Blues and, and country, actually, you know. Yeah. And then you had like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones who were crossing rockabilly music with, with the blues. Yeah. And it's just a matter of, it's like always cross, cross uh, colonization. colonization. Yeah. yeah. Sort of, uh, married couples do that, they finish each other's sentences. <laughs> <laughs> what we said before, it's cool to cross pollinate the genres and get in, you know, yeah. use all these things in music. But realistically, you can't. He couldn't do Fool's Paradise by Buddy Holly on a Motorhead record, uh -huh. in un, unless you did it in in the style that the fans of your group are. So this was an opportunity for Lem to do these songs that he's loved his whole life in the fashion that he wanted to do them in. And if he did them with me, say, it's, it's kind of safe. It's like, okay, oh, he's with the Stray Cats guy, then it's okay, you know? <laughs> and, and it's acceptable, you know? Right, and he's comfortable enough knowing that, the, that, that it would be in an, in an authentic, uh, credible way, that, because he loves these songs more, more than anyone. See, when we formed the Stray Cats, we had only really been into that music for a short period of time. We just found it, Brian and I, they had Bebop Alula on the jukebox at Max's Kansas City. That's and, right, they did, didn't they? And we were all in bands trying to do this and trying to do that and in Manhattan and that. And then we heard Bebop Alula and said, what is this? See, echo on the vocal, you know? Yeah. And then someone told us, we went out and bought the Sun Sessions by Elvis, the first rock and roll record. I mean, in my humble opinion, the greatest piece of plastic in the world. And it was like the world stopped spinning for two seconds, and I knew what I had to do. Yeah, like I had I long said, hair, I had bell bottoms, cut them off the next day, went to the Salvation Army, got a suit for 50 cents. I and, can't you know. imagine you in long hair and bell bottoms. <laughs> and, uh, I'd love to see, I'd pay good money to see that. <laughs> I'll give you a picture. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so we had only really been into that music for a short period of time. We like embraced it in immediately and wholeheartedly. Brian and I walked around New York with like pink suits on and hair up to here 24 hours a day. Uh, and we were able to record that music and play that music. Guys like Lem, those English cats from that period, you know, kind of the Rolling Stones guys and the, Led uh, the Zeppelin guys and 
Jeff Beck and all the, those cats. That that was their original influence. We're all brought up on that, you know. And it was kind of when they started, it was almost too soon to play that music again because it had just happened in the early '60s, late '50s. For us, there was a little bit more time elapsed <coughs> where it could be new again. <coughs> Whereas when Lem was 18, if you started playing Buddy Holly songs, yeah. it was like not long ago enough to be retro, kind of. Yeah. So, well, there was no retro. Yeah. It was just old-fashioned then. Right, right. <laughs> and uh, so these guys, and I worked with Jeff Beck on a record like this, which didn't come out. <laughs> like, oh. so, but, uh, so they've been loving these songs for 30 years by the time you get around to recording it. And so you want it done in the right way. Yeah. So that's why Lem was, you know, say, uh, so that's why we did it in the garden shed. Yeah, <laughs> kind of confident enough to let me do it with them, and and uh, Danny Harvey, who's an amazing guitar player. Man, he was the, he was the number one on that record. Yeah, he did everything on it. He's the last one on the list and the first one in the studio. I mean, he did so much stuff. He played organ, piano, lead guitar, stand-up bass. Jesus Christ, harpsichord. The guy he was did amazing. Everything. Yeah, we just played drums and rhythm guitar. That was it for us. <laughs> That's right. He played everything else. He was amazing, you know. He is a genius, Danny. Yeah, for sure. And he knows every note. He knows how to play everything, you know. He's, he's just one of them people that really pisses you off, plays 90 instruments, you know. Show him a trumpet, you go away for a quarter of an hour and come back playing a solo on it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, and... It was the type of thing that we always talked about. Hey, you know, let's do a record someday. And Buddy Holly song. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, you know. yeah, right. And X amount of years later, it finally you get the opportunity to do it, and it just ha you know, happened to click. Turned out very well too, I thought. Yeah, but it was fun. It was the type of thing you always want to do when you finally get a chance to do it. The Cat Club. Um, uh, my it used to be an abattoir. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, uh, I've been in the nightclub business for about 10 years or so. We had a, another place in Hollywood, and uh, that was a big place. It was 1,200 people, so if there's 500 people there, it's half empty, and you're sweating the, the rent. The Diamond, yeah. yeah. The Diamond Club. And uh, my partner, Ski Steve Scarduzio, and myself, we uh, got out of that. It just became too, too much of a headache. I started to go on the road again, and he's in the movie business. He started doing films, producing movies. and but. Something about having a club that's kind of cool. It's like your own little license to drink it all out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, this place became available, and we originally wanted to have like a snazzy cocktail lounge and play Frank Sinatra records and uh, velvet couches. Well, it lasted about and two hours. We were open for about two months. We were going out of business. <laughs> so one night, Steve and I went to Home Depot at three in the morning, bought a bunch of wood, we built a stage, called up some. Uh, called up like Guitar Center and Sam Ash and said, we need some gear, you guys, you need to get in here. They, so we had some equipment, we started to book bands, and we've been here five years now. It's really about the live, that's what I know how to do, is kind of the live music end of things. And, um... He's got a great pickup band, plays there regular. Yeah. Every Thursday, I mean, so, selected musicians, like, it's really good. Yeah, we play every Thursday. It's a good night out, you know, really. If you like rock and roll, you know. Yeah, there's a gang of us to come on Thursday nights. Myself, Gilby Clark. Does they play anything? Ex yeah. Guns N' Roses. Lem comes and plays. John Karabi from Motley Crue. Eric Dover and Ryan Roxy from Alice Cooper's band. And all sorts of people come. Brian May comes, plays when he's in town. Rod Stewart was here one time. Jimmy Page was one time. Bruce came. Dickinson yeah. came one time and gets yeah, up. Yeah, Brucington. Yes. And uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm leaving some people out. But um, everyone comes. On, on a Thursday night and plays. It doesn't start till midnight. And it's just like an all-star thing. It started out small, but then it... And we've been doing it every Thursday night for like four years. Who's ever out of town, another guy comes and sits in. And, and it's just a really fun thing. Because this end of the strip is about live music. We have the Roxy here and the Whiskey and the Viper Room. And uh, the kind of more snazzy things, you have to go, <laughs> go further down. So we're in the, the live music end of it. Yes, th this is the part of the strip, really, where all the bands came from. You yeah. know? The birds came from here, you know. The doors. Just around the, the corner at Cyro's, you know. Yeah, the doors started next door. It's a comedy club, you know. It used to be a nightclub. A lot of bands started there, you know. But there's a lot of history of music up here. When they had them riots back in the 60s, you know, then cop riots back here. Yeah, Sunset the, Strip riots. Yeah, because the kids being out after, what was it, 6 o'clock? Yeah, probably, yeah. It's 6 o'clock curfew back then, you know. It was like really bad tear gas and all kinds of shit just for being out. After the curfew, you know. So there's something about being on the strip. 
Yeah. And both of us live right here. We walk here. Yeah, it's, oh. it's cool, yeah. And uh, so we've been here five years now. And uh, it's just a cool little voodoo lounge that, like, that you can do things. Because last night, in order to do a gig like this, you'd have to put in the paper and sell tickets and deal with a club owner and then a promoter. Blah, blah, blah. You guys having the licensing, they're going to want to kick back from that. But it's like, well, you know, let's just do it at the cat club. Yeah. Make some phone Fuck calls, you. invite some friends. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, I got a club. Um, so it's just that kind of thing. It's a little clubhouse that we could all hang in. 